Hello everyone. It is six o'clock on the dot. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to first start out by saying hello and welcome to the Allentown Art Museum's MLK celebration. My name is Abby and I work in the public engagement department at the museum and I'm going to be your host tonight. This dynamic conversation will focus on museums and their role in fostering equitable and inclusive communities. It's part of a week long virtual celebration honoring the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. Through this series of events, we hope to honor his legacy by inspiring reflection, empathy, volunteerism, and activism. In tonight's program, we'll have a series of questions presented by our moderator, Max Weintraub, and we will also have time for questions from the audience later on in the program. Please post your questions in the Q&A section as you have them, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing our panel this evening. First up, we have our moderator, Max Weintraub. Max Weintraub is the new president and CEO of the Allentown Art Museum. Prior to joining the museum, Max was the senior curator of the Aspen Art Museum in Colorado, where he curated the first US museum show of British artist Rosie Wiley's work and a major survey of Chicago-based artist Barbara Kasten. Previously, Max served as director of the art galleries at Indiana University's Heron School of Art and Design, where he curated over 30 exhibitions, including solo shows of artists Tom Sachs, Ragnar Fjartensen, Mary Reed Kelly, Jillian Waring, and Shirin Nishat. From 2008 to 2016, Max taught modern and contemporary art history at Hunter College in New York and has worked in the curatorial and educational departments of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Denver Art Museum, the Whitney Museum, and the Museum of Modern Art. His essays on Bruce Nauman, Gambatista Tiepolo, Sally Mann, William Anastasi, Robert Berry, and others have appeared in academic journals, scholarly volumes, and exhibition catalogs. Max holds a PhD in modern and contemporary art from Bryn Mawr College. Up next, we have Andrew Plumley. Andrew Plumley is Director of Inclusion at the American Alliance of Museums, where he oversees both AAM's internal diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion work, as well as the Ford, Walton, and Mellon Foundation funded Facing Change Initiative, Advancing Museum Board Diversity and Inclusion. He started his career in education where he advised higher education institutions on diversity and inclusion strategy, as well as provided access and success programming for Pell eligible students of color. A systems entrepreneur, Andrew focuses on creating lasting system change for the communities he partners with and supports. He currently serves as a young black and giving back Institute board chair, board secretary at equity in the center, treasurer for the committee to elect G um, Gian Lewis for DC City Council, and Adventure Theater Trustee, an American Express InGen Fellow, as well as served as a City Council appointee police commissioner in the state of Vermont. Andrew has a BA from Middlebury College and received an MBA with a focus in social and environmental sustainability from the University of Vermont's Grossman School of Business. Thanks for being with us tonight, Andrew. Karina Aguilera Skaversky is a multidisciplinary artist that works mainly with photographs, video, and performance. She has exhibited widely in the US and internationally. She participated in the Cinquenca Biennial, which was curated by Dan Cameron in 2016, and the Sao Paulo Biennial in 2010. She has participated in numerous residencies and received multiple grants, including the Anonymous Was a Woman in 2019, New York Foundation for the Arts, also 2019, the National Association of Latino Artists and Culture, 2018, Jerome Foundation in 2015, and others. Currently, she is the, in the production phase of a new project, How to Build a Wall and Other Ruins, that is being funded by a 2019 Creative Capital Grant. Her work can be seen in fairs such as Freeze New York, Arco Madrid, Nada Miami, and Park Lima where she regularly exhibits with the galleries that represent her. She is an associate professor at Lafayette College. Thanks for being with us, Karina. And last but not least, Dr. Gregory James Edwards. 
the Reverend Dr. Gregory James Edwards is founder and senior pastor of the Resurrected Life Community Church, United Church of Christ, and president and CEO of the Resurrected Community Development Corporation. His contextual approach to urban ministry, based on understanding of the intersectionality of race, spiritual growth, education, empowerment, economic self-sufficiency, community development, and public policy, led to the creation of the Resurrected Life Children's Academy, the James Lawson Freedom School, and the, Cap and the Campaign for Change Community Organization Initiative. A frequent lecturer at colleges and universities, he has presented to faith-based corporate and nonprofit sectors and has been featured in Time Magazine. Dr. Edwards is the director of Power Lehigh Valley, the area's largest interfaith community organizing initiative, um, as well as the board chair for Promised Neighborhoods of the Lehigh Valley. He's a board member for Stand Up PA and co-founder of Lehigh Valley Stands Up, as well as board member for, First, for Community First Fund. In 2016, Dr. Edwards was inducted into the inaugural class of the Martin Luther King Jr. College of Pastoral Leadership at Morehouse College for his exemplary leadership in advancing MLK's beloved community through peace, truth, justice, and nonviolent direct action. In 2017, Morehouse further honored Dr. Edwards, inducting him into the college's prestigious Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers. In 2019, he was appointed chair of the Lehigh County Democratic Black Caucus, and in 2020, he was, he was appointed to the Pennsylvania Democratic State Committee. Dr. Edwards has been awarded the NAACP Man of Vision Award, the Peace Pilgrim of the Year Award, the Community Development Award by the Allentown Human Relations Commissions, the William Gray III Leadership Award, and the Prize for Multicultural Church Leadership from Drew University. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Edwards. It's an honor to have all of you here. So now that we've got done the introductions, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Max. Thank you, Abby, um, and welcome everyone. Um, as part of the museum's week-long celebration commemorating the life and legacy of Dr. King, I am, especially after hearing all of those wonderful accomplishments by the three of you, I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be able to join you um, to discuss the role of museums as we all strive for a more inclusive and equitable future. And I think it's an important conversation, obviously. And um, in the spirit of, of this week-long uh, celebration of Dr. King, um, I would first and foremost like to reaffirm that the Allentown Art Museum is an institution that believes in social justice, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and I would also like to take this opportunity uh, to say that Black Lives Matter and that we at the museum stand against racial injustice and inequality. And um, I, you know, I think before starting this, we were just talking briefly about uh, you know, being in 2021 and, and the week's um, events as they unfold. And I think it's fair to say that the, the topic of our discussion today is particularly timely and especially relevant. Um, and after months of being closed due, the, due to the pandemic, we at the Allentown Art Museum and, and museums around the country are, have slowly been you know, reopening and starting to welcome back visitors. Um, and it's important to note that the world that we are reopening our doors to uh, has changed dramatically in just 10 or 11 months. And you know, with 2020's trifecta of health, financial and social crises, museums are now thinking deeply uh, about how to reflect this new reality amid co coronavirus, um, and renewed calls for racial equality, uh, and specifically the roles that museums play in uh, society. So today we'll talk a little bit about the past, present, and future role of museums in fostering equitable and inclusive communities. And by way of introduction, uh, I would like to begin by reading three of 13 demands that a group called the Art Workers Coalition, which was a, a group of artists, museum staff, and other creatives, um, it, was a, it was 13 demands that they submitted to the Museum of Modern Art in New York concerning the museum's exclusive exhibition policies and practices. So just by way of, just by way of introduction, um, let me just read these to you. First on the list was, quote, the museum should hold a public hearing on the topic, the museum's relationship to artists, art, and to society, 
The second demand was a, a section of the museum should be devoted to showing the accomplishments of black artists. And the third demand was the museum's activities should be extended into the black, Spanish and other communities. It should also encourage exhibits with which these groups can identify. And I think it's important to, when we realize that these are all incredibly timely and incre incredibly relevant, but this Art Workers Coalition set of demands was issued to MoMA in 1969. And um, I just think as we, as we take that in and sort of process that, you know, and this is from creatives and artists and art museum workers, and we think about what that means um, given the conversations that are going on today, I'd like to just sort of open it up to, to our um, panelists here and think just first and foremost, a little bit historically, the historical context um, that we're inheriting. You know, the, 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 the mantra museums are not neutral is a message and a call to action that's been around for generations. And I think it's, it's important to open our discussion, you know, with this historical context and thinking about the knock-on effects of the exclusion and the inequality in museums that the Art Workers Coalition um, was laying out, you know, 50 years ago. So um, I'd like to start, you know, with this these three wonderfully unique vantage points, a you know, director of inclusion at the American Alliance of Museums, uh, an artist and a college professor and a, and a reverend and a leader of an urban ministry. From, from your respective vantage points, what, what is a museum's role to the communities that they serve? And how have those exclusions pointed out by Art Workers Coalition and a number of other artists and collectives over the decades, um, how are those exclusions manifested themselves historically in the context of, of museums and, and a community's relationship to them? Any of you? Well, I guess I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to be on this very esteemed panel. Uh, and thank you for your leadership, Max. Thank you to the Allentown Art Museum. So, you know, we believe that that Museums play a critical role, can play a critical role and be an intrinsic part of the community's fabric. Um, museums offer the opportunity to be repositories of hope. If they are engaged in radical truth telling by the exhibits, by the staff and by the culture um, of the organization, right? Um, I think I think it's a museum's job, not singularly, but a museum's job is to help point us in the direction of what it means to be human and humane, right? Um, by not hiding certain artists from the community. Um, there, are, there are museums that I've been a part of that, you know, these museums are buildings and they are in the community but they haven't done the necessary work, the heavy lift of really being a part of the community. So they're in it, but not a part of it. Uh, they will have black artists, um, often relegated to uh, a space on the other side of the building, on the other side of the facility, as opposed to being a part of the very um, infrastructure of the building and an infrastructure and in how it's presented. I, I remember, I'll, I'll go off on a skinny branch. I remember going to a, a museum uh, with uh, some of my relatives and they told us that the uh, deliveries are around back. Um, so, uh, and that, that was not that long ago. So, but, but that withstanding, museums provide an opportunity to, to really change the trajectory of a person or a group of people if, if they dare to have the courage, will and skill to show the truth of America, the truth of our rich, diverse tapestry. And I would say the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Um, so so uh, we like to, in museums, um, present the very best of America. And, um, and, and I say, if we're gonna really be America, we've got to show both the parlor and the kitchen, right? We have, to, we have to show both sides of that equation. Um, 
And, and uh, so I, I do think that museums offer the opportunity to point us in a direction that can inspire us to be better than what we were. Yeah, I, um, thank you for that, uh, Reverend. And I, you know, I, I have a quote from Ann Pasternak, who's the Brooklyn Museum Director. And uh, it just struck me a couple of days ago, I, I reread this quote and it said, you know, hers along your lines is museums are being called on to tell the truth from the painful to the celebratory. And it's such a simple statement, uh, but you know, the, the history of museums is an important one in terms of telling stories and telling, in terms of telling our story. And um, in, part of storytelling, you know, telling the narrative of the communities is to tell that truth, however uncomfortable that might be. So I think that that's an incredibly important point uh, to raise. Andrew or Karina, would you like to? Yeah, I was, I was gonna, uh, just to echo um, what the Reverend was talking about. I mean, I, really talking about structural racism. And so um, when, I, when I think about as an artist, I mean, museums, you know, I, I think like the importance of museums for me is so huge, right? I mean, it was like the second that I could go to a museum after um, things started opening up in New York, I was, you know, it must have been days like when the Whitney opened and I was there. So, I mean, I can, as a child whose parents are not artists, I remember like every museum experience that I had. And I see, I see museums as directly um, speaking to me, even though there is there was a lack of representation in terms of um, uh, de, in terms of race and gender. Even though I still have a connection to um, what was what was presented to me, right? I have a connection to all of those, you know, genius white men, right? I still have a connection to that. I I understand even that there's a place for that and I've learned from those artists, right? I think personally that's when, because of that lack of inclusion, however, I think as a woman, as a woman of color, it was hard for me to even begin to identify at, that I could be an artist, right? Like that that was a possibility. So I see that as on the one hand and then the other, experiences like I see museums really playing is is a role, an educational role. And so I think, you know, that when I see children at me going to museums, it's like, I, I don't, I actually, you know, I, I was lucky. I feel like the times that I went to museums was, was with my parents, even though they were very few and far between in my you know, my father didn't know what was going on. And my mother just, we just always ended up in the, the um, anthropology section because that was her interest. But, but I mean, I, but I, when I see children at museums, I think that's how you foster the lo that love and, it, that, and it's, it's intellectual and it's creative and it's emotional. And so I, 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 see museums as just so integral to our cultural lives. I, um, I just wanna echo both what Karina said um, and, and Reverend Dr. Edwards. And I also wanna um, thank you, uh, Max and, and Abby for putting this on uh, tonight. I think it's really special. And I wanna specifically thank you, Max, for making the statement that Black Lives Matter, because I think in the last four years we've seen what silence does and can do. And so I think making sure that we're continuing to make statements, uh, affirmative statements, about what we believe um, is is imperative uh, now and and in the future. We've we've learned the hard way uh, many times over uh, what what it gets when si what, what silence can get us. And so, um, and but I, I I also you mentioned kind of museums are are not neutral and um, and how that that um, kind of framework and 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 thought has been around for a long time. And I want to give a specific shout out to. Uh, Latanya Autry and Mike Marikowski, who were really 
really foundational in at least the reframing and kind of the co-producers of this of where we are now with the museums are not neutral movement. Um, and I think, you know, it's a significant to, to state that many or most of our of the art museums um, in their very conception were built on stolen land from native indigenous people uh, in this country and, and often still have a significant amount of stolen art in them <laughs> of brown and black people as well. Um, so I want to name that as something that we have to um, tell the truth about and reckon with as we, you know, continue. And I, uh, talking about the history of, 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 of museums and, and the institutions often can be, it can be framed as a, as a negative because of all of the things that have happened to exclude and other. Um, and I think it's important to name them, but also name what Karina and uh, and 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 Reverend Dr. Edwards were were talking about, but for you know from the very founding of many of these institutions, it was framed through very much the academy, and at the very heart of its teachings are still remnants and a legacy of white supremacy uh, from the people that attend the museums, from the people that work within the museums, to the very values in in which art museums have historically held, and that 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 value that lie in the construction of race. Um, that has produced, you know, specific and, you know, horrendous, disparate outcomes between people and society is all built on that kind of grotesque lie of a hierarchy of human value in many ways. And, um, you know, I think in, in other words, you know, some human beings just by their very existence and skin color are valued more or believed more or listened to more than others. Um, and when you take that lie that's permeated in all of American uh, society, um, you know, and, and kind of the, the context and social experiment, which is the United States and move that into art institutions that translates into a history of exclusion and, and bias and, and the structural racism that Karina was talking about. And I'll go off a of skinny branch really quickly too. Um, my first day at the American Alliance of Museums, um, I was facilitating a dialogue between multiple art institutions, their leaders and board members. And when one board member said that, you know, their board was 100% white and their staff was 90% white, but they collected 100% African art. Um, and they, and they, this woman said, uh, quote, you know, frankly, we need more white people with more money on these boards because they, meaning African people or people with African descent, didn't know how to collect their own art. Um, and that she thought uh, it was her role to teach them or, or us uh, how to collect and take care of that. And um, I was so taken aback by, by that. Um, it took me a while to kind of get, get centered again. Um, and I, I remember thinking, wow, she, you know, she really, she really said that out, out loud, felt comfortable saying that out loud in public in front of hundreds of people. And she literally has no idea how profoundly racist that is and profoundly problematic that is. And, and I think that dynamic is at play at many of our institutions and in many different forms. And that particular dynamic around, you know, who is art for, who is our audience, um, who gets to work at museums and who's on our boards or he, who even kind of gets, who, who even thinks um, is deserving of our time and design um, is, is wrapped up in that legacy of institutional models of exclusion and, and structural racism. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point in the sense that, you know, the knee jerk reaction when it comes to sort of how, you know, the role that museums play and can play is through, you know, the, the works on their walls and on their, their pedestals and the exhibitions that they put forward. And by all means, that, that that puts forth a very compelling and strong narrative that seems objective and authoritative and, and can be insidious if not, you know, mindfully um, and thoughtfully put together. But there's that, there's the sort of the, the other structures and hierarchies in museums and in the art world in general from boards on down that play, a, you know, a profound role. And so and I, I see you all nodding, um, you know, maybe Andrew, and if any of, if any of you want to speak to this point, but I know Andrew, you've um, done some work, um, I think with facing change about, um, you know, diversifying museum boards and the leadership. Um, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about that and just maybe expand on that, your last thought, just 
how, you know, how important that is to, it's not just about money. I mean, we, we fundamentally need to, you know, change how we define support and, and stewardship um, of museums. But can you just talk about some of the inroads that have been made in, in, in you know, unpacking and really deconstructing the board structure um, in museums around the country? Sure. Um, <laughs> boards are extremely problematic <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of the kind of last um, bastion. It's, it is a very untouched place in terms of doing racial equity work, DEAI work, anti-racist work, whatever the, whatever the term you, you'd like to use. Um, and based on the people um, <clears throat> that are on a lot of art in a lot of a lot of art boards um, and the kind of structural racism and general generational wealth gap that we see, um, there's a lot of kind of systems at play that can perpetuate racism. But I think when I think about institutions, art institutions and museums generally, I think there are a bunch of things that um, we should be doing. Some are and some are 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 trying to figure out for themselves what that means, but um, what we should be doing to create more inclusive and equitable culture is both at the board level and the staff level. And um, I think the main, the first thing I think about is really museums have to determine for themselves if they're up for this task. It's taken 400 years for us to get to this point in, in our nation's history. And we're not gonna dismantle racism and all other forms of oppression tomorrow, but um, if we're going to do it, it's going to have to be generational work that requires significant commitment, persistence, dedication um, from everyone. But I think especially white leaders and majority white institutions in the field, uh, frankly. And I and I and I think even more than that, it, this is really, from my perspective, just the beginning. It will get harder before it gets better. And I think we need to be real about what that means um, and really determine for ourselves that commitment. And I, I, you know, I think in the, in the facing change report that we did to the research to kind of get to where we are now in the work, 77% of museum leaders think that racial equity and DEAI are important to their, to achieving their own museum missions, but only 10% of those same directors have any sort of plan to achieve any of that. Um, and so there's a huge disconnect between what we say we want and what we're talking about and then the actual work that backs up um, any of that. And so I just go directly to tactics all the time because that's where I live. Um, but in, in terms of a couple of things museums can do or should be doing is establishing a shared vocabulary. For as many people are on the Zoom or having these conversations, there's often that many defini different definitions of what diversity, inclusion, equity, anti-racism mean. And often I, I hear people using diversity instead of equity and equity instead of diversity and making sure we have to make sure we're very clear about what we mean so that we can be having the same conversation with each other. Otherwise, we're gonna be talking uh, over each other. Um, and, and we do have to really focus on race. And I focus on race as, the social identity to focus on because it's the biggest driver of disparity, in, at least in the American context, it's the biggest driver of disparity. And so when you're looking at any social indicator, housing, income, healthcare, policing, you name it, race is the biggest driver of disparity. And so we have to be focused on that as the root cause. Um, and, um, and, and then I think externally, I think there's a really big responsibility that museums need to have in um, sharing the internal journey around racial equity in DEAI and anti-racism with constituents, with the audience, with peer institutions, because this work is super difficult um, and we're not gonna get it right every time, but the, us doing it over and over again and sharing successes and challenges are crucial in kind of driving and sustaining the work forward and so that we don't continue to make the same mistakes over and over and we can learn from each other. The, you know, those points from 1969 show that, you know, while we've, you know, certainly made gains uh, since 1969, we are, you know, if 2020 showed us anything, it's that we're still a country riven by inequality and racial division and other divisions. 
Um, and as you mentioned, you know, the DEAI, um, diversity, equity, access, and inclusion, you know, many museums, even before 2020, I think reported that as an organizational priority. Um, but, you know, in order to, uh, to implement on an organizational level that support, you know, in order to achieve that equity and inclusion, I think is still, um, you know, hasn't yet obviously been attained. And so I just want to think about the, the moment and, and, you know, right now, and I, I have a Vanity Fair um, title that, you know, there was an article that said, you know, what should a museum look like in 2020? And the subtitle was, as the art world experiences renewed scrutiny, curators, administrators, and artists imagine templates for change. So, you know, this is still necessarily and obviously an ongoing project one that won't be resolved as you suggest, Andrew, anytime soon, but looking to the present and the recent past, what are, you know, internally and externally, you know, what, what's the museum's role in and the responsibility to the communities it serves in 2020 and, and beyond? And, you know, what are some of those necessary internal steps, you know, to foster an inclusive institutional culture um, that, that will allow us to, to create lasting change? Uh, to, to any of you really, um, from all your, you know, unique vantage points, you know, in the community around this museum and others. I mean, I, I, I think that the numbers are really important, right? Um, and we, the, the, the level internally of the board and the staff and it's diversity in the staff and the board, and it's um, a paying wage for uh, the staff also. And I think that's, you know, you can see like what happened at the Baltimore Museum of Art in the trying to um, raise the wages of the staff. And you need the diversity within the curators to bring in um the artists that represent the diversity like it is it ends up internally the museum has to make those changes those um they have to open up at that level it's not enough to just i mean artists tend to work more individualistically it's not about just picking one artist right and just and 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 um uh you know, just giving that one artist a show. It's about creating a consistency and longevity and having a, um, a plan that goes beyond just responding to 2020, right? Sustainable change needs to be sustainable. Um, absolutely. Um, and, you know, if we, if we think about this moment and maybe we haven't had too many opportunities to um, you know, take in what museums have done to address some of the ongoing and specific issues, um, you know, since we've been closed for much of 2020, but have, have any of you seen any successful ways that museums have responded uh, to the various crises of representation and to the activism of the movements, you know, Me Too and BLM and, and other movements that have that have spurred some change in terms of the policies or the programs um, or the impacts um, this year so far? Has anyone, can anyone report any, um, you know, really successful or innovative um, responses? I, I can't speak for the museums as institutions, but certainly artists, <laughs> certainly artists, uh, that that don't have oftentimes I'll use the word the albatross of white supremacy bureaucracy uh, that has been known as museums uh, are taking to the street. And uh, if you want to find the heart of the community, find the artist um, that is untethered. Um, we we consider our artists our prophets, our griots, our storytellers. Um, and if you look at Black Lives Matter Plaza down in Washington, D.C. or in Oakland or in other places, it's the artists working side by side 
with activists, inseparable. And I'm talking about visual arts, I'm talking about spoken word, I'm talking about music, hip hop, I'm talking about not being bound um, because there's a, Dr. King called it the fierce urgency of now. When blood is running down the street, we are not afforded the luxury for the board to vote on whether it wants to adopt a diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusionary clause within its bylaws, right? So, so I, I, that that is one of the strengths of our community, and I and I don't speak for the entire. Of course, the the black community, brown community is diverse. We're not monolithic, but we still see overall museums as white institutions um, that are shrines, um, are coliseums of white cultural privilege, right? And so if you are, once again, I don't wanna paint a broad brush, but if you are uh, a, a young uh, child of black African heritage and you are integrated or onboarded into the fine art world, it still usually is with a white worldview lens, right? Um, uh, so, so this notion of changing uh, the institution of the American Art Museum, I think one of the struck, like what, not unlike any other institution, I mean, in this regard, right? Um, white supremacy is in the water of America. It is in the pipes. It's in the pipes, it's in the water. Um, we can drink from a fountain that says color or white, but we're all drinking the same water. It's gonna kill white folk too. It's just gonna kill them slower. Um, it kills black and brown folks with an urgency and an immediacy that we often see on television. So for, for a, an organization that's been enshrined in the privilege and protection of a worldview, even if it's false, to change that worldview, um, uh, that is really going to take a fundamental internal shift uh, of person and of power, because now you're talking about who's going to finance. <laughs> I have not found social justice financing to be at the top of most philanthropic enterprises. It's just so, so uh, you know, so so when we, when you start talking about who's going to fund, who funds justice. Oh, well, there's some folks, but by and large, you are talking about um, you are talking about dismantling the very identity from which people have people have um, gained unfettered amounts of privilege. And so, it's not by a mistake that race. We we can do great reports on race. We we are wonderful at writing white papers, summarizing, intellectualizing um, the church. Uh, it is the church overall is very good at that too. We write a whole lot of resolutions about reparations and do nothing about it, right? We like to talk about it because ultimately to do something about it, there's gotta be a shift. There's gotta be a shift in power, in perspective and persona that, that almost can cause someone to go through some type of cathartic moment. And when you've got a bunch of folks that think the same way, it becomes even more difficult. I see my hope in the streets of young artists. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, to all of that. I'm, I'm, you touched on so many great, great things. You know, young black and brown artists being the prophets, being the people that really are moving a lot of this work forward. I, I also love that you touched on the fact that in terms of in terms of financing who's financing justice and where the money resides and where the power resides within that it goes directly to the question max that you like who's who's doing well who's responding well to to this well black and brown led and black and brown museums that are community centered and focused have been doing really well because they're a part of the community in which they are part of um white led organizations are the ones that that are getting the cancel cancel letters. Um, they're the ones that are getting um, the dismantle X and, and uh, you know, executive directors and whoever get, you know, calling for their, their resignations. And so I think they're, they're it's, it's almost two different types of institutions, 
um, that we're talking about. And I've, I have, unfortunately though, I've seen that the black and brown led and the prim, majority black and brown folks on the staff are so under-resourced that they've struggled the most during COVID. So although they're doing probably, they're helping their communities um, in different ways and maybe better, um, they're also the most under-resourced because of the inequity in financing throughout, you know, you know, in, in the museum field generally. Um, and so I think that's a really, that's, a, that's something that we're going to have to fix. And ultimately we can learn a lot from these smaller community-based uh, museums. Um, but for the white-led ones, I think there's like a couple of specific things that they, um, that in terms of practices that I've seen folks start to do with a little bit more urgency that I think will ultimately help. And Karina touched on it, which is like the numbers do matter. Representation is a start. It is not the end, but it does make a difference. And so I think the first thing I've, I've seen museums start to do is disaggregate their data by race. And so you should be disaggregating your data in, in every way in terms of social identities, but specifically by race. So in terms of hiring, in terms of retention, promotion, professional development dollars um, at every level from you know, C-suite to mid-management to even to you know, security and volunteers, disaggregate your data. And you can't do anything about any of the inequity until you get a baseline of where you're at. And so you need to disaggregate the data. And some other things that um, some institutions I've seen get, <laughs> they've had a lot of practice, uh, but they've gotten better at is um, accepting feedback, both, both kind of in the cancel culture call out way and the call in, but creating some consistent feedback loops, both within staff and within your community um, is, 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 integral to, to doing this work. And I have a colleague that has a sign that says feedback equals love. And I think that that is a really great framing. It is a gift. Getting feedback is a gift. And I think most institutions posture is defensiveness. And I think that the more we can move away from defensiveness and really treat feedback um, from the people that care most about us and the people that we say we care most about, um, treating that really as a gift is really, really essential. And then the last thing is hold the CEO or director accountable um, with specific measures. The board can absolutely do that. And so can the staff. But if you, you know, if your community is X percent black, X percent Latinx, X percent native indigenous, well, you should have some conversations about saying, should our staff and board mirror our own community? And if your community isn't that diverse, well, should it mirror the demographics of the changing nation? Uh, there are plenty of ways to, and, and if the CEO is not accountable, it can't do that, maybe there should be another director or CEO. Um, I think it's really at that point. Um, and so there's plenty, there's many, many measures you can put in place, but holding that CEO accountable is, is imperative as well. I would just add quickly, if anyone watching has any questions for our panelists, um, that feel free to put them in the chat and we'd be happy to address them. Um, Karina, would you like to add anything? I was just going to mention, you know, the Reverend Doctor's idea about the history of museums, and it, it really is hardwired into the, the origin story of, of museums, the DNA of museums, that white supremacy and the 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 dominant narrative that's that you know has historically been told, and I think it's you know it, it it'll take generations to unpack that, or it has taken generations to unpack that, and I think we'd be naive to think it's it's going to happen in you know in 2021 just because of 2020. But I I would point out that there's been some incredible progress um, made. I mean, just I think this week the Guggenheim uh, hired Naomi Beckwith as the first chief curator. Um, yeah. as a person of color, which is, which is incredible um, and, and long past overdue. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think about, you know, uh, um, Andrew, you, you just mentioned about accountability and, you know, sort of real tangible metrics to measure progress, not only from the community, but internally. I think those are really important. And I know that there are structures in place and there's different, you know, museum hue and there's different sort of organizations that have been popping up over the years to address leadership in, in cultural institutions and, and whatnot. Um, but Karina, it, go ahead. 
No, I was I was going to say that, and I'm not sure why this occurred to me, but the one of the, I think another issue is like how much it costs to get into museums, right? Like that is really huge, and the, you know, the the um, the Bronx Museum. I was thinking about these, you know, uh, community-based museums that end up having some of the sim similar problems that the bigger museums have, and they definitely have funding issues. I mean, I know El Museo del Barrio has like has you know gets criticized for not being represented because if it reaches a certain kind of level, then you know it's like how does it define itself? Is it is it um, just uh, Latin X artists or is it Latin American artists? How do you make, you know, there's, so all, there's all these like weird um, politics around um, the smaller museums also that plays out a little differently, but making museums free, I think is huge. I think um, I grew up for a lot of the time in, in what my, Childhood in Washington D.C., and I, I, I thought museums were free. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, what? They're not free when I was older. <laughs> um, but so there's that, and then I was also thinking about, you know, how how these things play out, like in in Ecuador, for example, which is. Um, where I also partially grew up and how, you know, museums, the art museums play a much smaller role. It's a small, you know, it's a, outside of certain areas, museums are, have a smaller community. It's like a very, um, you know, it's a very, uh, a community that's already interested in it. So it seems like how do you broaden that interest because it, it has such, museums have such power. And I know that it's not directly responding to your question, Max, but it's just some of the things that I'm thinking about as we delve into yeah. this. No, I, I think the, um, you know, the admission fee is, is obviously, you know, a very important one and that becomes a prohibitive barrier to entry um, for, for people. And, uh, so that's, that's a really important one. And it does, you know, yeah, Andrew's brought up a couple of times, you know, the, the, the money, the flow of money is, is obviously critical. And I, you know, I was just thinking, it feels like a lifetime ago, but I think it was in 2019 when the, the, um, vice chairman of the Whitney board, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Warren Canders, if you remember, there was a long protracted protest about his presence because he um, had the company Safari Land that sold munitions that were used on, on immigrants at the border and in other conflict zones. And, and eventually he, he stepped down. Um, he was removed from the, the Whitney's board, but it took months and it was really a, a reluctant um, process by the institution. and, and in many ways, it's because he gave $10 million in the you know, 10 years prior to, to that moment or in the six years prior to that moment. And so, you know, there's always, you know, museums are stewards of, of culture, but they're also these repositories of power. Um, and I think that um, money, even just on the, on the lowest level of, of admission to those collections, you know, is, is a vital concern that needs to be addressed. I was just going to add that it was artists that in the end force him to resign by by threatening to pull out of the Whitney Biennial. So, I mean, that, you know, artists do have power, especially, you know, when we stick together, right? Absolutely. There's There started to become a, a sort of avalanche of artists pull, threatening to pull out from the Whitney uh, Biennial that was, when it started, it wasn't, you know, it, it was a couple months away, but as the protest grew on it, you know, it overlapped with the opening and that was the stress point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was just thinking about some of the, you know, the Gorilla Girls, which is an anonymous arts, you know, artist collective that since the 80s has been, 
just pointing out and 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 you know putting in our face declaring the the inequities in the gallery systems the museum systems for the, you know the exhibitions of of white men versus women and artists of color and um you know so the artists have always artists historically you know lead the way in terms of activism in terms of um, these moments of crisis and i think that 2020 was in many ways no different um, and I think arts institutions are obviously trying to um, do their part. And it's something that I think, you know, obviously we're having this discussion and hopefully in some small way it might, um, you know, participate in, in some change, whether by someone listening to us right now or just, you know, setting forth in our own minds to recommit to, to change. Um, but, you know, just thinking about what happens next you know we just had an incredible um transfer of power in in washington and just thinking about where we go forward i wonder if just sort of in in closing if any of you have any sort of summarizing thoughts we've thought about the past we've thought a little about the present sort of where are we in the future you know when we think about either museums specifically or or you know the the arts and culture in, in the service of community more generally. I'll, um, I'll just add, uh, you know, I, I think Reverend Dr. Edwards spoke a lot about kind of truth telling, real truth telling the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I really do think that there's an opportunity um, to meet this moment um, with some real truth and reconciliation um, and, and healing. Uh, and I think that there's a big, and I think museums actually can be, should be uh, in many ways, um, the model for a broader societal truth and reconciliation process. We are the holder uh, of, of, of stories and truth and culture. And um, I think it's something that we really, as a field, need to think about um, and, and, and start to act on. Um, and I'm excited about that, 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 that idea. And I've heard people you know, speak about this. And I think it's something that we should all move forward with collectively um, because I think there's an opportunity now. We've, we've, we've seen the differences. We've seen white supremacy in action over the last four years in many ways the insurrection on January 6th and how those folks were treated versus the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests in the streets. It, it, there is less of an opportunity to um, not acknowledge what's happening around us. And I think museums are the places um, that can foster that dialogue, bring community in and go out to community to really start uh, the truth telling both internally in our own museums and where we're placed in, uh, uh, you know, on the land and how we even got a lot of our objects and art um, to really doing the racial healing that we need uh, uh, by holding space or going out and creating space to do that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the museum field will, will meet the moment um, uh, what, and what you were talking about, Max. Yeah, I, mean, I think museums are, are well set up to have those difficult conversations, whether it was, you know, around Confederate monuments and whether, you know, they shouldn't be on pedestals, but in museums where they can be contextualized and put into that larger conversation. And, um, you know, the museum as, as educator is important, is, an, is a critical role moving forward. And we just, we do have a question that came in uh, from one of our viewers and it, uh, relates to education. It's for Karina, and it said earlier, you spoke about education. How do you think museum education programs and internship programs have evolved in recent years to make the museum industry more equitable and accessible? And of, of course, you know, internships and fellowships are, are you know, incredibly important pipeline to diversifying um, museum staff and to um, avenues of, of participation and inclusion. So it's, a, it's an important question, but Karina, do you happen to, would you like to answer that or have you, has anyone thought about that? I mean, I, I actually, in, in thinking about, there's that, there's that level, which I think is the higher ed level, right? Um, which is a great 
way to bring in, to, to give opportunities um, to students who, who might then become part of the community um, in the future. But I think the ch it's through public education, I think at the, at the very young level, at the elementary school level, at the middle school, at the high school level, though, I mean, how great, like what an important role museums can play for children. I mean, that seems, you know, the, the bringing kids in from the schools and giving them that um, opportunity or that access um, to bring art into their life. Like as an educator, I know, you know, I teach all these classes at a liberal arts school. I know that a lot of the students aren't going to be artists, but they're going to have an appreciation for art because they've taken an art class. And that is key, right? That's how I feel like through education, you build that community. I think as, as museums, you know, libraries in many ways have transitioned to becoming sort of these community centers where so much else happens. And I think museums in many ways are, you know, even before 2020, we're sort of transitioning to really be educational resource centers uh, to supplement, you know, public school programming and private school programming and community programming in general. Yeah. Can I add here, Max, about the, like the education departments in, in a lot of the museums that I'm seeing, at least from my, from my perspective is they often are the departments with the most BIPOC folks in them. That's one thing. So it is a great pipeline, um, but it's also the place, at least I'll make some very broad generalizations, but many of the education departments often have the most capacity to have and hold conversations around racial equity and DEAI. Um, and so they're really driving for a lot of the times driving uh, the, the institution's DEAI or racial equity practice most. Um, and I think it's kind of a self-fulfilling loop in many ways, um, but that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing around, around uh, the nation at this point. I agree. I, I worked in education departments at the Whitney and MoMA and I'm an educator who, you know, taught at Hunter and elsewhere. And, um, you know, being in the museum world with a educator's lens is has been so rewarding, but also so important. I think um, because it, it you you see that other side of of um, what museums can do and uh, how important that that work is. Um, someone wrote the sense of belonging education programs create in young students is so important and really can foster a lifelong passion. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have as my background the um, library from the Frank Lloyd Wright Museum at the Allentown Art Museum, a, a, a building by Frank Lloyd Wright that's in the Allentown Art Museum. And I have that in part because I grew up with the Metropolitan Museum's Frank Lloyd Wright room, which is from the same house. And, you know, those are enduring relationships that we make as children to museums and their collections. And that's all the more important reason to get it right and to make sure that that's a you know an inclusive message that we're imparting to everyone walking in our doors because it has lasting impact um, including on me where I'm, I'm still referencing works from my childhood and you know directly or indirectly um, reverend doctor i'd love to give you the perhaps the last word before we wrap up but if you'd like to we, we call that my line of work the benediction <laughs> <laughs> So, we'll uh, take it. Well, you know, there's a lot of work that has to be done here. Um, systemically, infrastructure, policies, protocols, internal work. Um, but, but if we go on this journey together, if we go on this journey together of somehow transforming these institutions into um, community centers, that can tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Then I think museums will foster the inspiration to marry head, heart, and healing. And, and, and that's, that's what we all need. I can think of no better um, sentiment to end this conversation.
thank you all for your participation. It was really illuminating and uh, hopefully tonight isn't the, uh, you know, the end of this conversation, obviously. And, you know, we're, we're celebrating the, the life and legacy of Dr. King, and this is part of those festivities, but this is a ongoing, extended, protracted, difficult process and, you know, to make progress. And, um, you know, so I, I look forward to working with all of you moving forward. And thank you to everyone who, who joined us tonight. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you, Max, for moderating. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and taking the time to celebrate the Allentown Art Museum's MLK Week. Um, I want to give a really special thanks to our panelists for being with us tonight and for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and for being so candid throughout the conversation. Um, it's, it's times like these that really move people forward. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our hometown heroes. There are so many organizations and people who are working to make our community a better place. We've highlighted some of them as part of our MLK celebration. Um, Dr. King believed in making a difference right where you are, and there are so many people doing that right here in the Lehigh Valley. So I just want to take a second to say thank you to each and every person who donates, who volunteers their time, and works tirelessly to make our world better. Um, to check out some of the other events and activities that we've shared for our MLK week, please visit our site at allentownartmuseum.org um, and join us tomorrow night at 530 on Facebook for our virtual closing ceremony. Again, thank you so much, so, so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to Max and thank you to everyone who attended tonight. We hope you have a good night and stay strong. <laughs>